interactive so that nobody falls asleep after lunch. Okay, it's just, I'm short, I can't help it. <laughs> so um, we'll try to keep it interactive, like I said. Ask me questions if uh, something's not clear, if that is something that I'm going to cover in later slides, I'll let you know and then we'll continue. So I'm Deepa Narayanan and uh, what I'm going to talk about is small business support programs, both funding and non-funding resources for cancer startups. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about SBIR, STTR, but I think Susan covered it earlier, so I won't go into great detail. I'll talk a little bit about how the center is set up at NCI, talk about funding opportunities that are available, non-funding uh, resources that we have, and end with a few application tips for a successful SBIR application. Um, uh, Again, I'll be really brief. These are congressionally mandated set-aside programs, and um, uh, there's a 3.65% set-aside of an extramural R&D budget at any institute or agency for supporting SPIR and STTR programs. But what that translates to at NCI is about a $173 million program last year. We expect it to go slightly up next year, and we expect it to be about $180 million each year um, at NCI. At NIH, across all of the institutes, it's about a billion dollar program. Uh, the NIH has about 27 institutes and centers. Uh, 23 of them have an SPIR program. Uh, each institute and center manages the program differently. They have their own priorities, their own funding decisions. Uh, the NCI, um, as a courtesy of it being the largest institute, has the largest SPIR program. Um, so why would a company seek SBIR, STTR funding? So we are the largest source of seed funding available. Uh, it is, it is a not a loan, it is a grant. Um, uh, no repayment is required. It's completely non-dilutive, doesn't impact stock or shares or any, in any other way. Uh, the IP rights are retained by the small business and it, uh, the peer review is robust and provides recognition and verification such that companies can leverage that for attracting additional investment. One of the questions that I often get asked is which one should I apply to, SBIR or STTR? And um, my response usually is it depends on where your principal investigator is primarily employed. If the PI is primarily employed or greater than 50% employed at the small business, then SBIR makes sense. If not, the STTR is a better option. The, the second thing to consider is where the work is being done. Uh, so for an SBIR, 66% uh, of the work has to be done by the company. Uh, uh, and for an STTR, only 40% needs to be done by the small business. So depending on the type of work, the type of resources you have, uh, you can decide whether an SBIR or an STTR makes more sense. Um, the, for the eligibility for both SBIR and STTR, the applicant must be a US-owned and operated small business concern with less than 500 employees. And we also allow VC-backed companies to apply for SBIR. Um, uh, and that, that's about a, a, a recent change, but we do allow that. But what's important to remember is whether it's an SBIR or whether it is an STTR, the award is always made to the small business. These are three phase programs. Um, phase one is a proof of concept. Um, phase two is the R&D portion of it, typically about $2 million over two years. Um, companies can apply to either phase one or phase two together. We call that the fast track mechanism and that reduces the time between review, between phase one and you know, an additional review cycle. Companies can apply directly to phase two if you're applying for an SBIR and you've already completed work that is equivalent of a phase one work. Um, uh, NCI supports an award called a phase two B bridge award, which is to follow on a phase two and we provide about $4 million over three years for the bridge award. Phase three is essentially a commercialization stage where companies are supposed to commercialize it with, without the use of SBIR and STTR funds. Now this is a critical slide because this is the source of a lot of confusion everywhere are budget limits. It is very confusing. Um, so the award sizes that are listed in the FOA are 150K for phase one and a million dollars for phase two. There's a hard cap, which you would assume is the final cap, but it isn't. Uh, the hard cap is 252K for a phase one and 1.68 million for a phase two. 
but there are certain topic areas that if you fall under these waivers, then the institute, uh, NCI or whichever other institute can go beyond the hard cap. So at NCI, if you are when, within one of those waiver categories, you can get funding up to $400,000 for a phase one and $2 million for a phase two. These waiver topics are very institute specific, uh, so you need to really look at the uh, funding opportunity announcements to see which, um, um, whether your topic qualifies. At NCI, these waiver topics are written as broadly as possible. We have very few technologies that don't fall within the waiver cap because we cover all therapeutics, all diagnostics, all devices, all imaging therapy, uh, low-cost technologies, digital health tools. So it's pretty broadly written waiver topic area. So for most of our technologies, we will fund up to 400,000 for a phase one and two million for a phase two. I want to talk a little bit about how the SBIR uh, are managed at NCI, because NCI is one of the few institutes, in fact, maybe the only institute where the management of SBIRs are, very, are centralized. What that means is we have an office um, right now, about 20 people or so, and all we do is to support SBIR companies. We don't, uh, we don't fund academic grants, which is a little different from how other ICs manage. And one of the things that has enabled us to do that, uh, that has enabled us uh, due to the fact that we have a center is we have some core activities that we can carry on. We, of course, do the central oversight of all of the programs that we manage. We do provide a lot of guidance to applicants who want to apply. So, um, so if you, um, uh, we help uh, companies prepare for the application, we'll talk to them, discuss. Uh, if you are resubmitting an application, discuss um, uh, what, how you can better resubmit and so on. We do a lot of outreach events in events such as these, uh, conferences, workshop, um, um, state-based organizations and so on. And the goal is to get more quality applications into the program. We also uh, seed emerging areas. We, um, all of us go to different conferences. We talk to a lot of people. If there are areas we feel require a little push from the NCI, then we do try to create funding opportunities to support certain areas. We also help with um, maintaining, we maintain a network of investors and we do try to facilitate uh, connections between our awardee companies and follow on investors. And I will talk about a little bit about how we do that in the next few slides. Um, and we also have a lot of training programs for companies that are funded. Uh, so these are our program staff. Um, uh, uh, we have people who have ex different areas of expertise, so you can reach out to any one of them uh, for if, uh, depending on which area your technology falls into. And I can share these slides, uh, so um, you don't have to take pictures of every slide because I'll share it. I, I'll, I promise I'll send it out. Um, but I think the most important thing that I want you to get from the slide is that um, NCI SBIR email address. So before you apply, send us your specific aims. We will be happy to take a look at it. We'll schedule a call with you and we'll go over your specific aims and give you feedback on how to modify that so that you have a better chance of getting uh, uh, success in your application. So if there's nothing else you get from this, please do that. Do you do this? How do you do this? What should you say? Uh, just send an email to that address. Yeah, and with your with your one page of specific aims, and then and, and somebody will reach get back to you. The, that email address is monitored all the time. Um, we also have a great uh, supporting staff that helps us manage a lot of these different non-funding resource programs that we have, um, and um, and I'll talk about those programs in a little while. Uh, at any uh, given time, uh, we fund about 450 odd projects. Uh, about 40% of our projects are therapeutics, about 15% are in vitro diagnostics, another 15% is imaging. Uh, we have 10% uh, is about cancer therapy tools, and then we have research tools, and we have health IT, behavioral modification, those kind of technologies as well. So as you can see, the type of technologies we fund span all across the cancer spectrum. Uh, anything that can help cancer patients, providers, or um, um, caregivers, every, all of those things uh, we will, we will uh, fund. This, this was a really fun study that we did um, uh, about a year back, and I just uh, thought it would be interesting to share the results with you. Uh, what we wanted to see what is the contribution of the SBIR, STTR program at NCI specifically to the U.S. economy. So we looked at about uh, 690 awards that we made between 1998 and 2010. 
We had funded about 450 odd companies, about $787 million through these companies. And we actually hired somebody outside, somebody not working at NIH, someone outside contractor to go and follow up and collect feedback. And they were very persistent uh, about trying to get that information out from these companies. And uh, what we found is that that resulted in about 247 products uh, that are commercially available and about 110 products that are currently in development. About $9.1 billion in sales combined with all of those pro products. About $3 billion in tax revenue back to the government. Um, $8.1 billion in labor income and about 108,000 jobs with about 75K average per job. And if you put all of this into an economic model uh, the, like those people did, it was a, it's a model that is commonly used in these kind of analysis that resulted in about $26.1 billion in total economic output. So that's about a 33 is to 1 uh, investment about of what we put in. So um, that sort of made us feel that we're doing probably an okay job, so we're trying to go ahead and do a lot more resources that we can support startups. So, um, and uh, we do that primarily, our primary goal is to fund companies, and we do that uh, through grants. Uh, these could be investor initiated, which is where most of our companies come in, is through the omnibus solicitation where people propose ideas that they have. We do have certain targeted solicitation, which are focused on gap areas or NCI priority areas. And we also have something called SBIR contracts, where we fund um, uh, NCI scientific and priority areas, but also those that have an area of uh, that have a commercial Im that can have a commercial impact. So these topics are usually done once a year, and um, and I'll talk a little bit again about the uh, how the how we manage contracts. So the funding opportunities that we have um, in terms of grants, we have, like I said, we have the omnibus solicitation with the due dates of September, Jan, and April 5th. If the 5th is a holiday, then it usually shifts to the next day. Uh, and we have a bunch of other um, um, targeted funding opportunity announcements. One is for illuminating the druggable genome, other one for single cell analysis, and so on. We also have some uh, uh, support program, funding programs for companies that are already being funded. So one um, uh, special grant funding opportunity that we have is for innovative molecular analysis technology, and this is for early stage work on highly innovative diagnostics and research tools. Um, we have another one for cancer prevention, diagnosis, and treatment technologies for low resource settings. One of the cool things about this particular funding opportunity is we've tweaked it a little bit so uh, some of the funds can actually be used for research outside the United States, which is a little difficult for other funding opportunities that we have. So we've managed to be able to do that for this particular funding announcement. Um, this is one of, the, um, uh, one of our uh, key funding opportunities, which is the Bridge Award. So this follows uh, our phase two. It doesn't have to be an NCI phase two. It, as long as you have any federal funded phase two that is working in cancer technology, you can apply for a phase two B award from us. We provide $4 million over three years and, um, and uh, to do technology validation and clinical translation. And one of the things that um, you know, we we require or we uh, strongly encourage is that you have matching funds that you raise from outside investors or third party um, uh, funds. And the third party funds could be institutional investors, corporate pharma, it, it doesn't matter, you know, state matching funds, angel investors, uh, anything as long as it's somebody else funding the technology. And we are, um, and we, we require a one is to one match of whatever funds the NCI puts in. Um, we did an evaluation a few years back about this program. We had about 21 awardees by that time. This is a competitive award within the NIH because it's also a very high visibility award because um, we, we uh, talk about this award to the entire NCI leadership. We talk about it at different events. Um, uh, and we, um, uh, so it's a very high visibility award for the NCI. So we, um, uh, I think, uh, we, when we funded it, we didn't know how much we would get in match, but we actually have been getting about $4 to every $1 that the NCI has been putting in into, this, uh, into the bridge program. Um, and, and the money has come from strategic partners, from, from, some from VCs, some from angel funds, some from state funds, uh, all, uh, all, across the, all across the board here. Uh, there, are, there have been 
products that have been commercialized through bridge funding and that are um, uh, uh, commercialized and available right now. So I'm going to change um, gears a little bit and talk about grants versus SBIR uh, contracts. Uh, I talked about contracts a little while ago, so but, but one of the key difference is that grants are generally investigator defined, but contract, the scope of uh, the topic is uh, defined by NCI. Um, the review is done separately. The review for grants happens at CSR. The review for contracts happens within NCI and we work closely with the NCI uh, scientific review officers to make sure that at least 50% of the reviewers have industry experience. One of the key differences between grants and contracts is that during grants, we encourage you to speak to us often and um, early on in the process. With contracts, um, it's because they follow the federal acquisition, the FAR guidelines, it makes it tough to talk directly to program. So you have to contact the contracting officers. They usually uh, send the questions to us. We will respond to them and they will respond to you. So this sort of, uh, it's a little convoluted process of getting feedback from program, but that's because the, the FAR regulations have to be followed. Um, the contracts are also available only once a year. These contracts topics change year to year and there's a, uh, it's usually released in, um, I would say around July and with a due date in October. And about uh, anywhere between 15 to 25% of our budget is spent uh, for uh, SBIR contracts. We also work very closely with our contractors because um, one of the other uh, key differences is we require more uh, frequent reporting for contracts rather than for grants. Grants, we only require you to submit a report once a year, but for contracts, we expect about quarterly reports. So um, uh, we just work a lot more closely just because we have a lot more interaction with contractors. Uh, the, um, our website has a list of past contract topics. Uh, this is also an excellent resource to look at even if you're not submitting a contract. If you're submitting a grant and there has been a contract in a similar area, it sort of gives you a sense of how NCI was thinking of what the phase one should be done, what should be done in phase two. Uh, this is by no means prescriptive. This is not what we're saying has to be done, but it's a good idea to take a look to just get an idea of what the, our thought process was. We do provide um, supplement funding, so if things didn't go well, um, all the mice died, things like that happen, then we sometimes can help uh, support, uh, uh, give a small um, administrative supplement for you to um, uh, do uh, additional work, uh, as long as it is within the scope of the approved award. So um, uh, any company that has an active grant can apply for administrative supplements if, if there are um, unforeseen circumstances that prevented you from doing what you had initially proposed to do. There are, uh, these administrative supplements do not go through peer review. So they are reviewed within, by the program, and uh, so, um, so check with your program director before you apply. Uh, sometimes uh, they can tell you about the, what's the best time to apply, what, uh, what your budget should be like, and so on. So contact program director if you already have an award. We also have another um, uh, similar administrative supplement uh, that is for um, encouraging and improving the diversity of the research workforce. So if you want to hire um, uh, somebody who is underrepresented in the health sciences, then uh, there are, uh, this, this supplement is essentially intended for that purpose. Again, this is uh, uh, discussed with your program director because this again does not have peer review and it's only uh, programmatic review is done for this. Um, we, uh, this is a new program that the NCI is participating in. It is called the Commercialization, Commercialization Readiness Pilot Program uh, for technical assistance. NCI will provide about $250,000 in total costs. And, um, and the idea behind this is to help fund uh, those kind of tasks that are not really research tasks. Uh, which you would do in a regular grant application, but are really very, very necessary to get a co product commercialized. So you may want to look at a regulatory consultant, or you might want to do market analysis, you want to do competitive analysis, all of those things. You want to do a quality management systems, scale up manufacturing. These are all you know, st uh, site startup. These are all important things that you have to do, but typically don't do very well in peer review. So this is a way for us to provide you with that additional support. And one really cool thing about this particular program is it just 
this particular funding opportunity is that it does not follow what is the um, typical SBIR rule of the 66 percent has to be done by the small business. All 100 percent can be outsourced for this particular award. So, um, but this is competitively review. It has to go through peer review. Again, if this is something of interest to you, you know, talk to your program director. This, and uh, oh, I forgot to mention, but it's probably important, is you can, you can apply for this if, even if you have, uh, if, uh, it's only for phase two awardees or phase two B awardees, but you can even apply to this even if your phase two has, been, has expired. So if, if it's expired within the past, there is probably a timeline, and I'm not remembering it, but it's about a year, maybe two years or so, if you had a phase two in the last two years, you can apply for this particular program. So now I want to talk about some of the, uh, talk a little bit about funding resources. Any questions so far? Everything clear? Okay, I must not be making a lot of sense. <laughs> Yes. Um, so last year I heard um, Ming Zhao mm -hmm. about NCI, um, the SBIR grants, and usually you have to have data, you know, more the better. And he was saying that uh, starting this year there might be one where you can apply without any data. We're working on it. Out yet? No, we're working on it. Okay. It's the NCI. Things take time, but we're working on it. It'll come out sometime. <laughs> So you were reviewers, you say you have to set of reviewers and industry peers, and uh, how do you uh, uh, plan to avoid the conflict of interest? That's a really, really good question, and it's a really tough thing to do. That's, that, that's one of the big... So this is being done at NCI, and, and for contracts, it's even more tougher, because for grants, it, I don't know how much you know about the whole peer review process in grants, but in grants, when you do the review, a particular reviewer can recuse himself for that particular review. So the per person goes off, review is done, that particular grant is reviewed, next grant comes for review, the person can be called back. For contracts, it's a little different, because every reviewer has to be there for every contract. So if, even if you have a conflict of interest with one contract, you can't review in the entire session. So it, ma it does make it incredibly challenging. We're always looking for reviewers. If any of you want to review, please let us know. We're always looking for industry reviewers. If you're qualified, industry reviewers are rare. We, we would love to have you as reviewers. So, so that's a task for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, as long as you have any federal phase two, it could be an NSF phase two, a DOD phase two, um, you know, maybe an NHLBI phase two, you can, as long as the product that you're developing has to be cancer specific. <laughs> It has to be an SBIR phase two funding. Yes? One of the criteria you mentioned for SBIR grants is that they have to come from a for-profit entity. Uh, the distinction there is for-profit company versus a non-profit research institution. Right. What about non-profit, non-research institution? Can they be the lead on an SBIR? No, for an SBIR, it has to be a for-profit institution. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things that we do. We have a range of services for companies that um, we fund, um, and uh, these are um, for phase one awardees, phase two awardees, for all, all sorts of uh, stage of development. Uh, but we also have one resource that I want to point out, and these, this is for people who have never received an NIH SBIR award before. So if you've never applied, then there is a program called the Applicant Assistance Program. A couple of ICs participate in it. And uh, what we have done is we have contracted out to somebody else to help companies with their um, application prep work. Uh, these are not grant writers. Grant writing services is not provided. You are expected to write your own grant. But they will help you with all of the registrations. And, and, and th this is a tough process. The whole um, application process is not easy. So the, there, there are these people who are, um, it, it's free to all the people who apply. 
um, we only select we select about 70 80 companies each time there's a lot of priority given to people from idea states where we don't get a lot of application from women PIs and uh, PIs that are underrepresented in the health sciences, uh, a little bit of special um, consideration is given to those folks. But um, uh, this is a it's, a, it's a valuable service, it's a free service, and we encourage you to take uh, advantage of that. But this is for um, people who have never applied, never received an SBIR award before. Never applied or never received? Never received. Applied can be fine. Never received. Um, uh, we also uh, do the i program at NIH. Are you guys familiar with the i program? So it's an it's a entrepreneurial learning program that NSF used to do for a long time. We borrowed the idea from NSF. We modified the curriculum to make it more life science friendly. Also, uh, NSF used to do it for academic investigators. We sort of modified it a little bit because we have startups in the program. And the idea, uh, the the one of the core aspects of the i program is how do you reach out to customers. Uh, teams are expected to do about 100 interviews in eight weeks, and we always find that around the 30th or the 35th interview, you've exhausted speaking to people you know and people who know who you know, and then that's when the real learning comes in, and we find this incredibly useful uh, for companies to sort of understand their value proposition and, and understand who their stakeholders are, uh, who their customers are, and um, we provide funding for this, uh, for both the i curriculum, as well as some money for travel to do all of these different interviews. So this is open to any uh, phase one awardee within, uh, at NCI. And at some of the other institutes too, there are about 21 institutes uh, and, and CDC who participate in the i program. This is an example of the business model canvas that they start with. So that you start with all your partners, your activities, and your value proposition. And over the interviews that you do over eight weeks, you keep iterating over this so that at the end you have a much clearer goal of where you were, uh, where you, you know, from where you started to where you ended up with. One of the other things that I mentioned we do is investor initiatives. And, um, and this is because we realized uh, that uh, we can fund the company, but we're never going to take it all the way. Uh, NIH is not going to be the one who takes the company all the way to commercialization. So we realize that um, companies need follow-on investment, and so we have so we um, uh, we we started maintaining a relationship with investors, whether they're VCs or industry partners. We um, uh, and uh, we have this network of VCs that help us in several ways. Uh, we share our portfolio with them often. Um, uh, almost every year we'll, um, we um, update our portfolio and give a copy to them, all publicly available data that we can share. Um, it's one of the reasons we are here at JP Morgan is to, to do exactly some sort of, uh, some, those kind of activities. We also, um, uh, we also do a program where we invite companies that we have funded to apply. Um, it's, it's sort of a pitch deck in a written format. Um, it's an application, and uh, we have about 100 odd, odd companies applying each year. And then we request this um, team of investors that are our friends to review these applications. Uh, this is all non-confidential data that they are supposed to provide. And last year, we had about 70 investor reviewers who reviewed these 100 applications. So that's also an excellent way to get, your techno get the company um, idea across to multiple investors. And then um, based on their input, we selected about 30 companies that they felt were ready for a pitch. And uh, we mentored them, we do some pitch coaching, and then we pay for them to present and pitch at one industry event that is best suited for them based on uh, stage of technology development, maybe geographic location, a type of technology, and so on. So, um, and then we uh, also, um, for these 30 companies, we develop ex uh, one pages, like, uh, and then we create this investor booklet of these 30 odd uh, pages, and then we distribute them widely within our network. We uh, email it to them, send it to them. Whenever we meet them, we give them that investor book. So that's how one of the re uh, one of the ways we try to get more and more of our companies um, introduced to investors because we realize that that's very key for follow-on investment. 
So last year, um, we, um, uh, we had 36 companies last year. Uh, we sent them to about 10 events. Uh, uh, early stage companies went to Angel Capital Association. The device companies were sent to Advamed and the MedTech um, uh, Innovator Program. Um, the, the other you know, people were sent to Bio, PMWC, Resis, this and so on. Um, so these companies had about 470 meetings with investors and strategic partners. Um, and, uh, it, it, and we've received a lot of positive feedback. In fact, uh, yesterday one of our companies came to me and said that they got their Series A through a meeting that, uh, that we uh, introduced to them at Bio. So that was very fulfilling to know that because of these <coughs> relations, people are getting investment. Uh, we also do a lot of educational programs. We do um, a pure learning webinar series. Uh, and the idea is for companies that have, a, have certain expertise or experience, maybe they've achieved a certain milestone to share their journey with the rest of the SBIR awardees. We are trying to do about two to four per year. Uh, these are webinars, one hour webinar in you know, three or four months. We've done one on ICOR, companies that have gone through ICOR share their experience. We did one on building an effective translational team, another one on IP strategies, and we have about uh, three or four more planned for this year. Uh, another fun thing that we do is we run a resources workshop. This is done every two years. Uh, um, because we usually have a whole new cohort every two years. And uh, this is done at our location in Shady Grove, uh, open to all active awardees. And we try to invite all sorts of resources that companies need uh, to take their technologies all the way. So we invite people from FDA, from CMS, maybe USPTO, other funding organization. We have uh, uh, pharma, medtech, VCs. We have p of other funding um, on non-funding resources within NIH. So we invite all of them. There are a lot of panel sessions. And another um, uh, really uh, cool thing that we do is we uh, do a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings between the panelists and the and the speakers. So, um, uh, and you know, needless to say, 10 minutes of FaceTime with the FDA has been really, really popular. So, um, so those, and we do uh, a lot of brainstorming sessions with NCI staff, with uh, people from various NCI divisions who have a lot, of, a lot more subject matter expertise. So this uh, workshop is done once in two years. Um, the other thing that we uh, started recently is a CEO roundtable. And the idea, again, is sort of uh, peer support. It's for uh, founders and CEOs and C-level uh, executives of NCI startups to sort of meet and mentor and advise each other on real life issues that they face. Uh, we have two pilot cohorts that are ongoing, one virtual one and one is uh, uh, in person and uh, that meets in DC. Uh, we are um, sort of figuring out how to do this program and we plan to expand it to other locations within the country and or maybe do more virtual cohorts depending on how, how the results are of the first pilot cohort show. So that's, um, that's another thing that we had started recently. Another thing um, that uh, is really important is connecting with regulatory experts. We, um, uh, we try to connect companies with the right people at um, either CDRH, CEDAR, or CBER as required. Uh, in terms of um, uh, getting uh, initial feedback or initial support. Uh, we, um, uh, we are trying, uh, during workshops such as the resources workshop, we try to get as many FDA people as possible to attend the workshop so that we can encourage more one-on-one -on -one sort of informal meetings with uh, FDA. Uh, we are trying to get some resources because we, we sort of tried to start looking at the FDA resource page and we got lost. So I'm, I'm assuming it's not very easy. So we're trying to see if we could get some resources that are more pertaining to oncology companies and, and provide sort of a, a sort of a curated list of resources on our website. So that effort is ongoing, and we hope to have that up soon. Um, uh, there's also an excellent resource within NIH. So the NIH has a central office called the SEED office. And I'm completely blanking on what that acronym stands for. Uh, it's SEED, and that office actually does have a re in-house regulatory expert, and people can um, call her to ask questions. And uh, if uh, and I'm happy to connect you with her if anybody has any uh, needs to do that. So that's that's an NIH available resource across um, all sorts of technology areas, not just cancer. 
Uh, NIH also manages certain programs called the Niche Assessment Program. This was for phase one awardees, um, and the idea was to do some market research. Uh, and, and they had another program called the uh, Commercialization Accelerator Program for phase two awardees to offer technical assistance in strategic and business planning, um, FDA requirements, technology evaluation, and so on. These two programs are going to undergo some changes because the, once the new seed office has been set up, they want to modify these programs. So there will be some changes coming soon. Uh, so stay tuned. I don't exactly know right now how we plan to restructure this, so that's still a work in progress. In addition to that, at NCI, there are other resources that are available for academic um, um, grants that SBIR grant people can also um, utilize. One important one is the Experimental Therapeutics Program, and, and the goal of this program is to um, help take uh, mostly therapeutics uh, and imaging agents from discovery to development. This is not a funding grant, so though no money is provided to the small business, but NCI partners with various CROs to actually do some of the work um, and, and do some of these uh, early, early uh, preclinical development works to take the technology forward. So that's a, 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 a resource that is available to everybody. Um, they also have a drug development consultation service, which is really not used a lot. And the idea, and it's a very simple program. It's a one-hour phone call. You can request it through um, through uh, that web link. And uh, typically, uh, staff from the therapeutics development program or the cancer imaging program, they all have a lot of extensive experience in drug development, and they are willing to share their expertise with you. It's about a one hour, uh, and they can help with your drug discovery strategy, what um, animal models you should do, what is your FDA plan, and so on, and, these, uh, and they're willing to, perfectly willing to help you with that. So that's, uh, that is also a resource that is available. There are other NIH resources available in terms of um, preclinical drug development program or the NCI Prevent program or the NCI Nanotechnology Characterization Lab program at, um, at, the, uh, at Frederick National Labs. All of these resources are also available to um, uh, small businesses or, in fact, even academic investigators. So before I move on to application tips, any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, like from an academic perspective, like the drug development or the experimental therapeutics program, is there a submission, specific submission requirement? Or there is a specific submission requirement, and I am not really well versed in what exactly it is. But if you want to talk to me later, I will connect you with the right person, and they can provide you with that details. Anything else? Okay. Yes. What's the services that you offer to the general technology lab? What is the NCL? Yeah, what are the services? What's the services that you provide? I am not fully aware of exactly everything that they do, but uh, com some of my companies have used that to sort of, uh, so if they are developing an imaging agent or a nanotechnology agent, they have used that to sort of uh, provide uh, specifications of that molecule, of that nano, uh, and, and whether that falls into whatever category that they wanted it to be. So they've used that that way, but again, I am not, I don't remember exactly everything that they do. I think a couple of them are, but I'm not sure every single one of them is. So um, in terms of um, funding uh, tips, so what exactly is NCI looking for? So we are essentially looking for an innovative solution for a significant unmet clinical need. We want a solution that has significant commercial potential. Uh, and by significant commercial potential need not always for us mean a large market. Because we do realize that there are markets like rare cancers where it may not be a huge market, but it is very important. And um, as NCI, we do support that. We, are, uh, we encourage people to submit if, uh, for companies that are um, 
too early for private investment, where you're leveraging the expertise of the company founder, you're seeking funding to produce feasibility data, or if you're an established small business and you already have some additional funding, but you want to produce, want to sort of pursue a new agent or to fill your pipeline or another indication, uh, those kind of technologies are also um, something that we would uh, definitely consider. Uh, before you start writing the application, consider your company's uh, weaknesses and strengths. Uh, leverage those, uh, leverage your strengths. Uh, another thing that I would ask you to do is to review uh, f funded SPIR, STTR projects. There's a link below that has some sample applications. Keep in mind these applications are very, very old. Um, nobody right now is willing to share their applications with us, so we can't put it online, but some generous folks did it a few years back, so we have those. Um, and discuss your specific aims again with, the, with your program director. I'm, I'm sorry, but I keep repeating this, but I think it's really important to do that. Um, the Project Reporter is a database that has all NIH-funded programs, and I feel this is an excellent resource that uh, companies should use before they apply. You, you can search this, uh, you know, you can ask, uh, search by IC, by uh, SBIR, STTR, you can put keywords of your technology and so on, and it gives you a sense of what NIH has funded before in this area, so especially in certain technology areas where we've funded similar technologies, it really helps if you've looked at it and how, if you differentiate yourself from something else that has been already funded. Um, an important tip is to start early. You require a ton of registrations before you can apply, and these registrations usually take time a lot longer than you initially anticipate. So uh, start early, um, read the funding solicitations very carefully, and take time to address all the requirements. Um, you might need access to equipment, you might need access to expertise, uh, you might need time to get your team together, get the letters of support. All of this take a lot longer than you initially anticipate, so take, take your time over this. Um, have a lot of discussions with your eventual customers, stakeholders, investors, all sorts of people to sort of refine your vision. Um, T talk to people who've received SBIR awards before. Um, academic collaborators are great because they have a lot of grant writing expertise. Uh, use that expertise. Um, and again, talk to us for the latest uh, that we have on whether there are new funding opportunities, what our priorities are, uh, if there are other things that you should be doing when you are applying. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I say talk to us, and I keep repeating this, is because we do give you feedback on your specific aims page. And I believe that this is the most important page of your application. And I, um, I don't think I'm, I always tell this, and I don't think I'm wrong, you probably should spend as much time on that specific aims page as much as you spend on the rest of the application put together. Because that is very, very key, because this is the first page I look at when I get an application. This is the page that reviewers look at. And keep in mind, your application is being reviewed by about 20 reviewers or so. Um, it would be lovely if all of them read every single page of what you write, but that always doesn't happen. So um, your, the reviewers who are assigned to your application will definitely read everything, but there are other people who are scoring your application who are not assigned to your application. Uh, and so this is the page that most people will read. So this page should sort of encapsulate the entire essence of your application. It should, uh, you should get a sense of what, why, what is the significant problem you're addressing, what's the innovation in your application, what is it that you plan to do, have really quantitative milestones and, and really describe how, what, are, what are the steps that you want to take to commercialize it. So, uh, so I feel like, I think that this is a very important page and that's why I say, you know, talk to us, we'll help you refine that page. Uh, the research strategy depends on, it's a six page or a 12 page, depending on a phase one or a phase two. Um, uh, preliminary data is, requir is, not, is not officially required. It says it's not required. I've never seen one funded without preliminary data, and I don't think it will be. So put as much data as you have, because I think it's important to get it funded. Um, 
and provide uh, and also propose the scope as much as the time and budget constraints allow so don't don't be over ambitious because you don't have the time within two years or whatever budget you have to do a lot so so be reasonable um, provide a detailed technical plan provide alternatives plan b's uh, all those kind of things make it a very compelling application yes Sorry, sorry, I can't really hear you. In the A section, uh, one page. Yeah, yeah. The second bullet point, you know, it has to be in very early stage. You don't know exactly what, you know, good strategy and spend. Unless we spend years on it. Right, right. No, we're not really uh, asking about, uh, because that's the whole point of the grant is to get that data. So we're not asking for that data up front, but we are asking about what you, so if you are do, uh, providing a technology, what, is, what do you think is the competitive advantage of that technology over what is being used state, uh, state of the, uh, in state of the art right now? So you have, a visual, you have an idea of that, otherwise you wouldn't be doing this because you see that there is need for improvement. And so what, what, what does that, what gap does your technology address is what really we're looking for. So um, uh, we also like letters of support uh, we think, uh, you know, letters of support from consultants and collaborators are sort of expected, but letters uh, from key um, opinion leaders, letters from uh, people who want to collaborate with you, from end users, your customers, all of those uh, make your um, application a lot more competitive. These are not necessary, but they do help. Uh, the commercialization plan is very important, so take time to develop that. Um, uh, make sure the bio sketches are all in the right <laughs> format. Uh, not that that's a big issue if it's not, but, it, uh, but I have heard reviewers comment on this, and it sort of leaves like, oh, something's not right here. And then that sort of may affect, may color review, you never know, so make sure that it's in the right format. Uh, budgets, uh, again, pay attention to the budgets. Uh, if you are doing either animal studies or human subjects, uh, make sure that those, those sections are well written and you've covered all of the requirements. There are webs the NIH website has all of these information <coughs> on it on what are the requirements if you're doing humans or vertebrate animals. So pay attention to that. Uh, don't try to hide potential weaknesses. Uh, uh, reviewers can spot them, so it's always best to sort of mention them up front. So these are potential problems that we might encounter, and these are how we plan to address should, we, uh, should these pro problems um, uh, come, uh, come up. So um, th th uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the budget, because um, our budgets are uh, defined as total costs. Uh, so when I mention $400,000 or $2 million, these are always total costs. Um, small businesses or SBIR grants can request a 7% of the total budget as fee. So this is entirely as taken as company profit, and companies can request that. Um, uh, uh, the subcon keep make sure that you know the the 33% rule or the 50% of the work is done by you and the sub or whatever is done by the subcontractor. Make sure that that is done correctly. Uh, and also the other thing is uh, about $6,500 of your phase one and about $50,000 of your phase two budget can be used for technical assistance. They can use 50,000 for consultant services and all of those other uh, non-research uh, non activities in any grant, so that is possible. Uh, if you do request that, you can't participate in the niche assessment program or the CAP assessment program right now, but um, since those programs are still being developed right now, if you're applying, I would urge you to use that money here <laughs> rather than for niche and CAP because we don't know what those applic programs look right now. Uh, understand the review criteria. We have five scored review criteria, significance, approach, innovation, investigator, and environment. So uh, we are looking at whether the pro product addresses an unmet need 
Is there a market pull? Is it, does it have a commercial potential? Is there a clinical need for a product like this? So that's something that we're looking in significance uh, in terms of approach. Are your methods well developed? Are you doing the right experiments to get you to the right answer? Um, do you have plan B and all those kind of things clearly laid out? Um, how, and in terms of innovation, we're looking at novel, what is the competitive advantage of your technology? That's essentially what we're looking at. Uh, do you have all of the expertise you need to do the work that you proposed in that particular um, application? And do you have all of the resources you need to do the, to do the work? For phase two, uh, we look at the commercialization plan. It's not a scored criteria, but again, it's a very important criteria because what we are looking at is does your business strategy make sense? Have you thought about your regulatory strategy, reimbursement strategy, your future fundraising strategy? What's your marketing plan? All of those things are things that we do look at when we finally fund an application. Um, it's also important to remember that SBIR grants and academic grants are different. Uh, the um, academic grants are very science focused where the product is not really necessary and for SBIR grants it's a little different. You might have the most brilliant science in the world but if it doesn't lead to a product then it's probably not a good fit for the SBIR. So it's important to keep the difference in, difference in mind when you are um, uh, thinking about an academic grant versus an SBIR grant. If you're funded, yay, great. Uh, start taking advantage of all of the resources that we have. If you're not funded, well, use the summary statement as a roadmap for next steps. Talk to us. We can help you interpret the summary statement and, um, and uh, give you guidelines on how to um, revise and resubmit your application. You do get an extra page as an introductory page when you resubmit, and I can uh, and we can talk about how do you respond to reviewer critiques in a constructive manner and not be really defensive. Um, uh, there are some common pitfalls, uh, and uh, so what if the reviewers don't believe you're working on a significant problem? And, and here, I think it's important to consider reviewer points from their point of view. These reviewers have really different strengths. They have different approaches. So again, talking to programs sometimes will help in clarifying how to respond to that. Uh, but be, provide data to support your claims. If, there is, if you think that there is a market need, provide data, like so many patients and so on. And, and one really uh, good way to address this is to use letters of support. So if you have key opinion leaders and um, stakeholders and customers saying that this is a need, then that really helps. So use those letters of support. Remember, you only have a few pages in your application. So use all of these other pages to get your point across wherever you can. So letters of support are a really good way to do that. What if the reviewers didn't understand your proposal? And I must confess, this is the most common uh, th feedback that I hear. They just didn't understand me. I hear that all the time. And, 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 and sometimes the onus is on the person to explain this because it's your science. Um, and one of the things that I suggest is, uh, is of course, you know, you have to write the application clearly, make sure all of the data is right, the graphs are labeled, you know, all of that apart. Uh, one of my suggestions is to ask somebody else to review your application. Because most of the time the problem is it's so clear to you because this is what you've been living and breathing. But it's not very clear to somebody else. And, and because this is, again, a broad-based review panel, think when you, you know, think about uh, as you're submitting a paper to Nature or some really broad-based science, scientific journal rather than a purely technical journal. So um, uh, maybe not somebody who's working in your lab or you know, maybe the lab down the street, uh, somebody who's in a similar scientific area but not in your area, do they understand what you are trying to convey? And sometimes that really helps uh, get the point across because, and it's usually because, not because the app comes run, it's just because it's so clear to them and it's not as clear to somebody else. What do the reviewers believe? Your team is not well qualified. So again, you know, it's useful to provide background on team member qualifications, um, add consultants and collaborators as required. It need not be a paying consultant in some cases because some people can consult for a little while and, and that's something that you can work out. Um, one of the things that, it's important to have the right kind of people. I mean, even if you're doing, say you have a surgical technology and you, know, you really need to have a surgeon, but if it's a breast uh, uh, technology and you, ha you don't have a breast surgeon and you have some other surgeon, then that's a problem. So just make sure that those kind of issues don't happen. And I also 
also think it, it, it really helps if you have sort of a roles and responsibilities area where you say these are the things that we want to do and this person ha who has this expertise is in charge of this area. Then it's very clear who's going to do what and then you have that, uh, that expertise covered. So that sometimes helps uh, in, in an application. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind are, is resubmission is a good thing. Our resubmission success rates are far higher than our original success rates. Uh, in fact, it's almost double. So um, don't get discouraged. It's, it's not uncommon to not get funded at the first round. And, and so if you address this, most reviewers are pretty happy that, oh, you know, we said this, this address, and then they give you a better score. It happens most of the time. I won't say all the time, but happens most of the time. So resubmission is not, uh, is always uh, encouraged. That's our website. We are on um, uh, LinkedIn and on Twitter. And uh, if you sign up, we can uh, send you new funding opportunities that we have. And, um, and if you are an awardee that have had a success, let us know. We'd love to hear about success stories about the SBIR program. And um, I think that's it. I, I will, any questions I can take? If you're at the uh, early stage, um, don't have a compound identified yet, but a target. Um, you've identified a target that you're trying to find a lead mm -hmm. product. Does that send you more to the academic grant area then, or is that still something you can use by bringing this program? No, I think that is fine. We Screening is something that we are a little bit more, I think, but if you have somewhere closer to a lead identified, I think SBIR still might apply. But we can talk about, it depends again on the technology, where you are, and so on. And we can talk when you first start a small business, you don't have all the talent set up yet. Right. So as the company grows bigger, you start a more well-established team. Right. So do we have to do a price or do we have to list those vacancies as our weakness in order to move on? So again, we, we would like to see somebody who has some sort of a commercialization expertise uh, to do that. And if uh, so some where somebody should be there. It may not be somebody who is full-time within your company. It can be a consultant, and, and that's perfectly okay. You help? Okay. All right. Thank you very much for listening to me. How we can take your slides? Sure. Um, uh, will you be sending the slides? So it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a week or two. So you have yeah. access to it. Okay. Or you can come and meet me and give me your card, and I will okay. give it to you. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I didn't include you.